uh, today's talk is on digital contact tracing systems uh, or applications uh, that has been uh, deployed in many countries and in most of the European countries uh, as a tool for fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? So I have been uh, quite lucky in, in this sense because I has, uh, has been able to have a, a first-hand experience on that. I has been advising the Ministry of Economics, uh, more in concrete, the Secretaría de Estado de Digitalización e Inteligencia Artificial, which were in charge of deploying uh, the application in Spain, um, what is called uh, radar COVID. Okay, so I I has been uh, able to to witness uh, in, at first hand the uh, development of those systems. I think that the final result has not been a success. I don't think that uh, there has been they are playing the role that uh, they could, could can play. But I think that there are many lessons to learn uh, that are very interesting systems to, to know, and uh, maybe to think how they can be improved for uh, next other uh, similar problems that we can have in the future. So I think that the, there are many lessons to learn here, even though the uh, final outcome of those systems has not been as good as uh, we, uh, you could have seen in the beginning when we were working in the uh, deploying that, okay? So, uh, I'm going to go to full screen. So, well, I didn't add, uh, said before, my name is Jorge Garcia Vidal. I'm a professor at uh, Department of Computer Architecture at uh, Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, and here you can find my uh, web page and my email address in case that you are interested and after the talk you can uh, contact me or have any comment or question, or etc. So, um, data contact tracing systems has been deployed with the promise of reducing the uh, transmission chains uh, in uh, the case of COVID-19, and in general, could be in order in any other infectious uh, disease that uh, is transmitted in similar ways. So, on the left, we have uh, a typical scheme, a graph of uh, of people who is infected by this disease. Uh, will be the people in red, and as we know, if the number, the expected number that a person can uh, infect is larger than one, the very famous uh, number R, the, uh, the growth is exponential, okay? Because uh, we have a kind of geometric series in, in that case, in the ideal case, until most of the population or until a big share of the population is infected. But uh, if we are able to cut since the beginning uh, some of those transmission chains, we can decrease the factor R, and so we can uh, keep control the uh, transmission of the disease. This is the main uh, promise of data contact tracing systems. And this is especially important in a disease as a COVID, because all we know, or we have learned a lot about this disease in the last months, and we know that there is a chance that you can transmit the disease even if you don't have symptoms. And so uh, asymptomatic people uh, is, is a, a very important factor in this case, because if you don't have uh, symptoms, it's very easy that you keep transmitting the disease for many days. And so uh, depending on where you are, you can even become a super spreader because you can be in positions where you can have the potential of transmitting the disease to many uh, other people. So uh, this is one of the reasons uh, that uh, made those applications potentially very important for this type of disease. Well, the uh, basic uh, performance of those applications is pretty simple. Uh, we use uh, a system in, in the concrete case we use Bluetooth low energy, even though this is not the ideal 
for some of the functions uh, uh, we are using the system, but we are using Bluetooth Low Energy mainly because it's a present in almost virtually in almost the all the smartphones that people has, and so the Bluetooth Low Energy broadcast uh, information that is used for three main functions. Uh, first is to detect users uh, who are in proximity. Second, for exchanging information through the uh, Bluetooth low energy packets. And third, and this is a function for which Bluetooth low energy is not ideal at all, is to estimate distance. The, in this case, the distance is estimated based on the the strength of the receive uh, signal, okay? Well, so essentially the devices of Alice and Bob are continuously broadcasting this information, exchanging anonymous IDs, estimating distance of the contact and duration of the contact. And then after some days, maybe uh, Alice receive a positive COVID uh, test, meaning that uh, she is infected. And what the system does is Alice must notify, and this is voluntary, but must notify the application of this uh, condition, must report this positive test. And then the system uh, must alert all the uh, other contacts of Alice that are at risk. So there is um, some exchange of information and there is a function which is risk assessment uh, that must be performed in the system. And depending on the score that you get from this risk assessment, every user can be notified that it has been at risk. In this case, is Bob. And when a user is notified, so uh, he must or she must take some actions like having a, going to quarant uh, self-quarantine, having a test, etc. whatever. This is depending on the measures uh, of the health care uh, system of every country. Well, uh, let's, let's review a bit uh, the different aspects or different parts of the system. One is the, the Bluetooth low energy. Well, Bluetooth low energy, in this case, can work in two different modes. Can be uh, models. I can use a broadcast model meaning that the Bluetooth Lab Energy use the advertising mechanisms for uh, sending information. On the left, you, you can see the payload of beacons for two different systems. One is Robert, the system used in France. The other is DP3T Gain, which is the system used in most other European countries. Uh, those are 16 bytes. As we mentioned, there are systems uh, for which uh, we require 32 bytes. This means that uh, the broadcast model is more challenging because you need to use two consecutive or two different packets for sending all the information. There is a second a mode for operation, which is connected, meaning that once the devices advertise the, uh, the Bluetooth low energy uh, service, they establish a connection and exchange data. In this case, there is no limitation on the data you can exchange, but there is a problem uh, because uh, you have to connect to every of the, of the terminals which are nearby you, so there is some scalability problems. And there is a hybrid mode in which uh, is mainly, uh, you use broadcast models and in some cases use connected model mode. And this is um, mainly uh, used to overcome some limitations imposed by iOS, by iPhones, uh, which are in background mode. Uh, essentially what happens with iOS, which is in background mode, that the only way of communicating with those devices is that uh, Android device wake up the application by using a connection uh, to the uh, iOS device. Well, uh, there is a very important factor uh, for understanding those applications and uh, is who is responsible of managing the Bluetooth low energy uh, system, okay? In uh, some applications, in some systems, is the application itself through the standard API provided by the operating system, 
that manage the uh, Bluetooth low energy um, subsystem and essentially provides the Bluetooth low energy, the anonymous IDs, the strings that, that, uh, that identify the users. So on the left, the responsible of managing Bluetooth low energy is the application. Okay? The problem here is the manufacturers of Android and iOS, Google and Apple, don't, don't favor this type of, of operation and they favor the operation on the left. The operation on the left, those uh, Android and iOS provide an API, which is called uh, Google Apple Exposure Notification API, so that the application uh, only has to invoke this API, but most of the operation, for instance, the generation of anonymous IDs or the storage of anonymous of received anonymous IDs or the comparison uh, with uh, those anonymous IDs and the anonymous IDs of the infected users is done inside the operating system itself. Uh, this uh, has the advantage of uh, allowing the compatibility at Bluetooth low energy layer between Android and iOS, so you don't have those problems with iOS devices in a background mode. So the development of the applications is way simpler. But the problem on the right is that you are, I mean, the, the, you have to use the protocol imposed by this API. So uh, Google and Apple choose to, uh, to use uh, the one protocol that I will explain later called the P3T. And so if you want to use the Google and Apple operation, you have to use DP3T in the version imposed by Google and Apple. And this has some very serious implications on the system performance. Well, Bluetooth Low Energy, as I mentioned before, is used for estimating the distance and the, the duration of the contact. The problem is that the, uh, the, the strength of the electromagnetic waves, the strength of the radio signals received by the uh, devices, by the smartphones, depends very much not only on the distance, but only also in other, on other factors. For instance, all we know that the, those antennas are quite directional, also that our body has, is, with its plenty of water, has a uh, strong absorption for the electromagnetic waves that are used in the ISM band, the uh, frequency band used by those systems, etc. The radio signals, uh, bar at the strength of the received radio signal depends also very much on reflections, on absorptions, multipath fading, I mean, many, many factors. So it's really difficult to uh, estimate accurately the distance of the contact length based only on the strength of the received signal. So this is how systems work today, but we know for sure that the results are not very accurate. There are some alternatives, for instance, ultra wideband, which uh, basing the, can base the estimation of distance on time of flight will probably provide better results but also has other problems. Um, well, this is one of the limitations of the systems, the use of Bluetooth low energy for estimating distance and length of the contact. Well, the story of the deployment of those systems is pretty interesting. During the month of March, uh, there were two teams working in developing uh, contact digital contact tracing, which was adapted to the requirements in Europe. Other countries, mainly in Asia, has deployed those type of systems uh, relying very much on the use of geolocation. But as we know, the use of geolocation, it's uh, quite uh, problematic if you want to fulfill G the GDRP, the law or the laws of privacy, the privacy in European Union. And so uh, there were a lot of effort of developing those type of systems without the use of geolocation. So there were two teams. One was INRIA and Fraunhofer Institute, 
and the other was mainly based on EPFL, the uh, university, university, Federal University of Lausanne in Switzerland. In the beginning, it appeared that the system developed by INVIA in France and Fraunhofer Institute in Germany was the one to be implemented in, in the whole Europe. And it's based uh, on what is called a centralized system. But at the last moment, due to a lot of pressure of privacy concern organizations, etc., Germany uh, changed uh, its mind and moved to the uh, system uh, developed by EPFL to uh, DP3T. One of the reasons was that the other reason is that Google and Apple only supported the uh, model on the right, the model of DP3T, and so the implementation on the, the left for the left system uh, was really a nightmare. It's very much more complicated because of the limitations imposed in this case by the iOS and Google, uh, I mean, also by the Android devices. So uh, the situation was that most Europe switched to the right model, so the P3T guy, and only France uh, stayed with Robert, okay, the, the system on the, on the left, the centralized system. Uh, from, I mean, uh, there are some differences that we'll see later, but one big difference between the two systems is that on the system on the right, the risk scoring is made on the devices, meaning that the information which is stored on the servers is minimum, minimal, so the servers know very little about the users, and so they are better from a privacy, strictly privacy, uh, point of view because the backend servers has minimum information about the users. But the system on the left, the risk scoring is made on the central server, meaning that there is much more information stored in the server. So meaning that the owner of the server, in this case, the government has more information about the users and also that you are concentrating the privacy risk on the backend server. But on the other hand, the uh, healthcare authorities can know way more on what happens uh, on the pandemic and the risk scoring algorithms can be based on more rich information. So uh, there is this dichotomy or compromise between the effectiveness of the, of the tool and the privacy requested by the users. Uh, one important point is that those applications are only effective when the amount of people, the percentage of people that download and use the application is very high. And the system on the left is more difficult to defend, is more, dif is more is easier to attack from a privacy point of view. And so it's easier for people to trust on the system on the right, even though, and I think that this is a very paradoxical, uh, there is a paradox that the system on the right is way more secure or more way more privacy protecting against the problems, I mean, uh, against the uh, misuse of information by the government, but puts everything in hands of Google and Apple. So you are like trading, changing the, uh, who has, is the owner of the, of the, of the, who knows the information, whether the government or whether to American companies. This is very <laughs> funny from a point of view, but most of the Europe went to the system on the right. Uh, I would like to explain very briefly how the two systems uh, um, behave, of, 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 or which is the operation of the two systems. Essentially, uh, both systems are based on exchanging anonymous IDs. In the case of Robert, those anonymous IDs, which are strings, are uh, called EBITs. In the case of DP3T Gain, are called EFITs. So I will keep the two different names but essentially are strings, random strings. In the case of Robert, the random strings are generated by the backend server. The backend server gives a list of edits to the users. The users, every 15 minutes, use a different of those edits to, to difficult the tracking of movement of users. And also they use different MAC addresses. And they broadcast those edits uh, using the Bluetooth Low Energy System. And the other devices are just storing, logging, they receive evidence. 
when a device uh, receives a positive COVID test, give a list of the received habits, what are called exposed habits. We call spores because are the habits uh, sent by the people who is in risk of being infected, not by the user who is infected. So this list goes to the to the server, and the server can identify the users which were at risk, and so can perform the risk scoring and can notify the users for which the use scoring score is higher than a given threshold. So in this case, the server knows a lot about the what happens on the system. In the case of DP3T GAIN, uh, we call, I mean, DP3T is the original protocol, slash GAIN, we, we say that because it's the, uh, the most implementations, and I think that virtually all the implementations that are used are DP3T implemented on top of the API provided by Google and Apple. So in this case, the ephemeral IDs are generated by the devices. So the server doesn't know those ephemeral IDs. They broadcast those ephemeral IDs. And when one user has a positive COVID test, it relays to the backend server all the efforts that the, this user, the user that has been infected, has broadcasted. And so the user, the server, sorry, what does is uh, distributes to all the other users those infected habits. And all the devices compare the received habits with this list. And if there is a match, this means that they have been in contact with a, a person that has been infected, meaning that um, they can, uh, they can, uh, they can, they, they can run the risk scoring algorithm. So as you see in this case, the backend server is simply a relay of information. Its operation is almost zero. It's almost, it's very, very minimal operation. Well, the centralized system has two main vulnerabilities. I, I'm not going to go into detail. You have here in the slides uh, more details, but essentially, what happens in the robot, the main vulnerability of the robot system is that if somebody attacks the server and obtains the list of habits and obtains the trapdoor, the key that has been used to generate the habits, could he make a match between habits, the broadcast identifiers, and identities of the users? This, this in theory, is not possible, but if there is attack, there is some possibility of this happening. If this happens, you could track users because if you have Bluetooth around a city receiving habits and you could know the identity of the users, then there will be the possibility of tracking users. This only happens if the backend server is compromised. This is not that easy, but there is a possibility of that. Or, or either if the, if the authority running the backend server is a corrupt authority and does that, uh, assuming that this is something that is not supposed to be done by the authority. This is very way more difficult in the case of DP3T. DP3T, there is almost no possibility of tracking users. It's very, very difficult to do that. So from this point of view, from the possibility of tracking users, the risk is higher in robots. Then uh, there is also in Robert the possibility of disclosing social graphs. Essentially is when people report exposed habits, I know that this person has been in contact with other persons. The backend server in theory could know that or, or one attacker that uh, has all the keys of the backend server or the trapdoors used in the traffic backend server could know that. So if the the backend server is run by a corrupt authority or is compromised in security, there will be the possibility of building a social graph of contacts of people, which is very serious uh, privacy concern. So this is very difficult to be done in the case of DP3T. At larger scale, it's almost not possible to be done in DP3T. The third, a third privacy attack is the possibility of re-identifying infected users. This is 
almost possible in any application, but only a very small scale, okay? Because if I have an application that I use when I have, I'm in contact with a single person, and then I switch off the application, and the application notifies me of a risk, I know that the risk was produced by this only single person, but this obviously is an attack which is not scalable at all. So, and this is this attack is not feasible at large scale in the case of Robert, but this attack is pretty simple to be done in the case of DP3T, because uh, if I have a Bluetooth low energy receiver and I can, for instance, install a camera, video camera, so I can cross information of timing and persons, for instance, faces, and I receive the list of infected IDs, I could identify whether some of the users has been infected, has been received a positive test, and so I could uh, potentially, I could publish a list of people that has been infected by COVID. So this is not very nice, and this is a vulnerability that, at least in theory, is possible in the case of DP3T Gaia. And there are also other types of attacks, mainly based on this vulnerability. So uh, what happens is that after some months, the, the different countries started to build those systems, but then the researchers um, propose some other applications, some other systems, which are essentially based on generating, generating search secrets by a Diffie-Hermann chain. Uh, one is called Pronto, the other is called Desire. Desire is proposed by INRIA as a possible substitution of Robert. Pronto has been proposed by one university in Italy. And those uh, different those systems will almost be no vulnerable, at least for the vulnerabilities that I have described before. So these, I think, the, the, those are the systems to, to go on. In fact, me personally, I propose uh, a modification of those systems, which is called IDPT, because uh, I propose that, and this is being a uh, discuss now is in a draft in the European Standardization Institute, Etsy, for uh, because this system, which is a modification of the two previous systems, also based in a generation of search secret using a diffie hellman chain, could be used for providing some interoperability between Robert and the P3T, which is something that cannot be done directly. Uh, I think that using IDPT is possible to, to obtain this, uh, this compatibility. Well, uh, so this was a description of the technical issues on those applications, but one of the main factors or main difficulties here are not technical on the phones, but are on the integration with the health system. Uh, so the, the main problem is that uh, the health systems of different countries, or in the case of Spain, of different autonomies, are not well prepared for this type of digital tools. So, uh, for instance, when a person receives a positive test, it's important that the healthcare system provides a, a key, a unique key, so the person can introduce this key in the application, and so the application can notify the other users. But this key uh, has to be generated very fast and very automatically, and is very difficult with the current systems uh, because the, they are not prepared for that. So the delay until I get the positive test and I get the code can be of several days, and in this case, or maybe I don't receive the code. And so in this case, the effectiveness of the tool is, is reduced a lot. Also, uh, many of the health authorities in Europe are not big believers on those systems because, because they are new, obviously. And so uh, they are not big believers, the effort in, public, uh, in publicity or the effort in the right implementation of the system has been limited. And so you enter in a kind, kind of spiral. If there is not, not an effort in publicity, the downloads are low. If the downloads are low, the effectiveness is very low, and so uh, you don't make effort for doing that. It's a kind of self-fulfilling uh, pro prophecy uh, situation. And so my, my overall view is that the effectiveness of, the, of those systems in Europe has been quite low if you compare with the potential that those systems have. Okay? 
Also, uh, there is some issues on the risk scoring. Risk scoring is now based essentially on time of contact, for instance, larger than 15 minutes, and on distance, uh, lower than two meters. But we know that there are other factors that are very, very important, like whether the contact happens indoor, outdoor, whether the contact happens in an environment where the use of mask is mandatory, whether the contact happens in a place with a good ventilation, etc. And so uh, those uh, factors are not used today on the risk scoring algorithms, at least as far as I know. And so this means that the risk scoring is not very accurate. So you can have a lot of false positives. And in this case, also, people don't trust the application results. And so the effectiveness also is reduced. There is a big issue also in interoperability. Uh, Instead of having a single application for all Europe, every Europe has deployed its unique application. And so there is an issue of interoperability. The interoperability between systems that use, for instance, DP3T is quite simple to achieve. Uh, there is now what is called the European Federated Gate Gateway System service that uh, is running. Essentially, uh, this operation is pretty simple. What happens? is that all the information is replicated among all the backend ser servers in Europe. And the users will download the, um, the, the request, the keys for the research coding on when they upload the keys because they have a positive keys, uh, sorry, positive test. They have to provide what are called a list of countries of interest, the countries in which they have been. And so using that, you can either if you have been in a country, in a foreign country, you can either must include your keys, exposed keys in the keys of those countries, or either download the keys of those countries to compare with yours if your problem is risk scoring. But the interoperability is not very difficult. Uh, there is more difficult in the interoperability between rubber and DP3T, so between France and the rest of European countries. For instance, the format of the beacons is different, which makes interoperability more, more difficult, obviously. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, some basic interoperability in the protocol itself. And I, I did a proposal, which is to use IDPT with DP3T. And with this proposal, you have to modify slightly Robert, and you have to include IDPT in the application. You can effectively achieve this interoperability between Robert and DP3T. Uh, this is not in operation today, but as I mentioned before, this is being standardized in the Etsy. I'm not going into the details how it works. It's a bit complicated, but well, uh, you have this on the slides, okay? Well, so as a summary, uh, these applications have faced complex issues. Uh, this is a politically loaded issue there is also problems with uh, communication. There are legal ethical problems. This must be voluntary. Uh, uh, this cannot be used by employers to discriminate employees, etc. So there is also uh, some aspects, important aspects in, in uh, regarding legal and eth eth ethical issues. There is a problem with integration with public health system, which are not prepared for uh, this type of digital tools. Uh, for instance, also, there is the problem of what a user should do when receives a risk scoring notification. It's not that easy to, to solve this problem. Uh, risk scoring must be improved. Uh, Bluetooth low energy is not the ideal system for estimating distance. Uh, there are some population, probably the elders, which are the people which is who is more at risk here, which are not smartphones users. Google and Apple has taken a role that, from my point of view, is not acceptable because they have been taking the role of the healthcare authorities in Europe. This is also the problem with interoperability. So there are many issues. Uh, but I think that um, maybe not at short term, but in the long term, I think that those tools can be very valuable to fight against pandemics, maybe of COVID-19 or other pand pandemics which are, have similar uh, characteristics. So uh, thank you very much. And I think that I have finished my presentation.
Okay, so I'm going to see the comments. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so I tried to answer the comments, right? It is possible to have a signal through a wall. Uh, this, uh, the strength of Bluetooth low energy is uh, like 10 times lower than the strength or even more lower than the strength of Wi-Fi. So even though it's not impossible that the signal travels to a wall will be very much attenuated, okay? So I don't think that uh, the problem of people in different rooms which are considered to be in contact is possible. But there is a situation, for instance, if you go to a cashier and this person has a plastic wall, probably this plastic wall, the attenuation that uh, introduces is not that important. And in this case, the system will give a uh, contact when probably the contact is not, is, is not there. The same happens when you are wearing a mask, for instance. The system doesn't have nothing that into account uh, for evaluating risk scoring. Bluetooth technology can give you time contact in its contact. Well, the contact time is deduced because you are periodically transmitting beacons. So essentially what you do is you count how many beacons or you count the first beacon and the last beacon. And from that, you estimate the duration of the contact which is not a perfect estimation, but this is how it's done. How much information is necessary to keep in the device? Uh, well, uh, you need to keep essentially all the, in, in, uh, for instance, uh, Robert users must keep a list of all the received EBITs and the list of all the EBITs that must be transmitted in the future. But this list is updated, updated I think, that every day. So, is not, is not a lot of information. And for the case of uh, DP3T, you have to store the list of you have, what you have transmitted during, for instance, during the, the last 14 days, but you don't store the efforts. You store uh, a random number for, for, which is used to generate the efforts. So the amount of information you have to store is very small. And also you have to store all the efforts that you have received during the last 14 days, for instance, which is not that much. Uh, one problem here is that you have to uh, download all the infected users that have been generated in your country or in the countries that you have visited. Uh, this, uh, this is a lot of information, but it's compressed somehow because instead of uploading the efforts, you upload the random numbers that are used for generating a sequence of efforts. So the amount of information is not that much. I, I don't remember the number, but probably you have to download every day a uh, kind of megabytes of information, not, not, not a lot of information. What is your opinion about near field communication, RFI? Um, I think that um, not, I don't think it's the best system here because the distances uh, are smaller. So maybe with RFID, maybe uh, can play some role and NF nfc i don't see i don't see uh, a role here maybe nfc can be used but not for estimating distance maybe it can be used for checking that you have been in that place this could be interesting but uh so um i don't think it's interesting for uh, this distance but maybe have a role nfc have a role for some systems like for checking that you have been in a given place I think that ultra wideband is interesting for estimating distance. Uh, to 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 way downloaded because you don't want to send your info. Uh, only megabytes. Okay, check in. Okay, uh, I don't know if there are more questions. No more questions. Okay. So it has been a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope that uh, this talk has been interesting to you and uh, well, uh, enjoy your hackathon, okay? <laughs> so bye-bye.